I'll just give it over to Omar. Okay. Uh, thank you everyone for coming today. Um, happy to be here in Iteka. Today I'll be presenting a joint work uh, with Hussein on uh, joint assortments and optimization uh, on the value of personalized assortments. So, and if I get some time at the end, I will talk about some uh, other work. Okay. So let me first by uh, introduce the problem first. So here we have, let's think about a firm that has access to universal products. And initially the firm needs to select a subset of uh, this uh, product uh, that they will sell to their uh, customers. But furthermore, we will assume that the firm has access to some personalized data about customers and they would like to uh, customize the display subset to uh, each customers in this second stage problem, I'm gonna call it the customization problem. So let me first illustrate the problem. So throughout this talk, I'm gonna denote the product by this uh, blue squares, okay? Joint assortment and customization is a two stage problem. In the first stage, uh, let's say we have some uh, capacity constraints or due to uh, limitation space, the firm can carry only a subset of this product. Suppose we have a cardinality constraint K, they can only select K product. Uh, and this is my first stage problem, uh, which I will call the assortments problem. But then furthermore, they can customize what they will display to uh, each customer type. So let's say we have like three customer types, okay? Uh, so, and we have some uh, information about uh, the customer type. We can think about purchase history or demographics. Uh, and the firm will, is, will not show all the products, but will drop some of them. And depending on the customer type, they will show a subset of this uh, product. Okay, so if we get this second customer type, and I show these four other products, finally, same thing for the third customer type. And this is the, this problem is what I will call uh, the customization uh, problem. Okay, so the goal is to maximize the expected revenue of a firm from a, a customer visit. And this is motivated by uh, settings where these assortment decisions are made before the start of the, of the sailing season. For instance, uh, let's think about Amazon who want to, like, uh, they want to, to buy, uh, to sell, sorry, um, running shoes. So they would go to the vendors and uh, select an assortment of product. They cannot select everything because of the capacity constraints. So they will select only a subset of uh, this product and have them in their warehouses. But then furthermore, uh, they might have access uh, to uh, personalized uh, data about each individual that is coming to the, the, the platform. And then they're not like to show the same assortment to all the customers, but they might drop some product and show only a subset of the, the ones that were carried initially, depending on the preference of each uh, customer type. And, uh, the second stage problem is the, the customization uh, problem, which happens at the display uh, level. So same thing, for instance, for online groceries like uh, Fresh Direct. So uh, they will offer yogurt, let's say, to their uh, customers. Uh, in the first stage, they need to select a, you know, a set of yogurts that they will have in their warehouse. That's the assortment uh, problem. But then furthermore, when these customers arrive to, to the so the platforms they can show a uh, personalized subset or we call it a customized subset depending on the, the, the customer uh, type, okay? So the goal of this talk is to study this joint um, assortment and uh, customization in the problem. So we're gonna do first present the model and then uh, ask the question that we will check on this. Throughout this talk, we can consider N product. So that's the size of the universe of product and M customer types, okay? Uh, we'll assume that each customer types makes uh, uh, purchases according to uh, the classical, this fundamental choice model known as MNL, multinomial logic uh, model. So let me uh, define that. So here we'll need like to define RI, which is like the revenue of each product I. Theta J is the arrival probability of customer type J. This is the market share of uh, customer type J. And then for each product and each uh, customer type, we'll define this VIJ, which is the preference weight of customer type uh, J for products I, okay? So this is 
higher if the customer type J likes more the, 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 the product uh, I. And finally, uh, we're going to start by thinking about the cardinality constraint. Uh, so the K is the upper bound on the assortment size. That's the Fermi Sutari uh, in the first state. So under the MNL model, the probability of customer type J purchasing product I, if we offer assortment S, is given by this ratio, which is just taking the utility or this uh, preference weight of uh, product I for this customer type, and then dividing that by uh, all the alternatives. So here, uh, the one stands for the preference weight of the no purchase option. So we just normalize the preference weight for, of the no purchase to, uh, uh, to one. And um, this is uh, the purchase probability under the MNL model that captures this substitution effect between um, this, uh, this product. So it just, it scales linearly. It scales with the, with the sorry, with the, with the preference weight of the, the product. And then you, you just divide by the sum of the other alternatives. So with that, we can define what is the revenue of customer type J if we offer assortment S. Well, this is just summing up over all the product that we have in our assortment, multiplying uh, the revenue of each product by the purchase probability. That's going to give us like the expected revenue that we can get from a customer if we offer um, uh, the assortment uh, S. Okay. So RJ of S, that I'm going to use this notation a lot in my talk. So this is the expected revenue from customer type J. If we offer, of course, this depends on what we offer to the, to the, to the customer. So with that, I have all the ingredients to define our model. So we're going to call the model customized assortment problem uh, uh, cap. OK. So this is a two-stage uh, problem. In the first stage, we are uh, basically uh, optimizing over all subsets of cardinality uh, k from the universe, right? And uh, we want to maximize the expected uh, revenue. So we are taking a sum over all customer type. Theta j is the market share of this customer type. And then we, the second stage, there is another maximization problem where out of the product that we carried initially out of this S, for each customer type j, we are going to offer a customized subset sj. So that's uh, why we are maximizing over all subsets of s of the revenue function that we get from customer type uh, j. So this is the first step is the, the assortment selection. So we select an assortment, and then we can customize what we display to each customer type so that in, there is another maximization problem. Yes. Uh, why can't we exactly do just the one maximization problem for each type? Is it because of the K? Yes, exactly. Good question. So in fact, this is because of this uh, cardinality constraint here. So if we did not have that cardinality constraint, then that's both down to just a single stage problem where we are going to solve an assortment problem for each uh, customer type. Yeah. So what is the order of magnitude typical in, in the case of Amazon, for example? So what's what am I K and how many different customer types are there? So usually, like in terms of the customer types, that's a small number usually. So uh, like I would say something between that could go from three to, to 10. So that's a, a small number for customer type. For the Amazon application, it could be different for other application. And then for the, for the, for the K, uh, and then I would say that depends critically on the products that, uh, that's so like in, for instance, like, like for jeans, like the like the number of products would be of the order of a thousand, and then K would be like a, something like a like a like a hundred or which could be different from from others. So that depends critically, I would say, on 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 the product. Yeah. So just so, but then in this case, if K is order hundred, right, the number of types like whatever three, five, something or seven, then this K does not constrain a lot, does it? So the, in, in a sense, that you select each as a J individually. It probably could still be within K. So basically, we are going to study the problem, and I mean, K is a, always a trivial approximation for this uh, for this problem. What we are going to aim for is like something much stronger than that does not scale with the number of uh, of products. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions about the model? Yes. So this excludes the possibility of buying of the client not buying anything. 
Uh, no, we, we are still uh, taking that into account. So yeah, so this is the expected uh, revenue that we will get from client J. So if basically the VIJs are much smaller than the weight of the no purchase option, this revenue is gonna be zero, right? So like basically if one is dominates, which one is the no purchase uh, utility if dominates the utility of what we are offer him, the expected revenue is going to be close to zero. So yeah, we are taking into account the no purchase option. Other questions? Yes. So if you show the client a bunch of low quality items, Yes. Because of this looks like if the bigger your bag S is, the more likely you're to sell something and make money. Yes. Okay. Yeah, yeah. that is true. So basically that's one of the properties of MNL model. It's just saying that the no purchase uh, probability decreases as the offer set gets larger. Yes. And from a practical point of view, probably these SJs should be cardinality constrained as well. I understand it's not here. Yeah, so that's a good, very good uh, question. So we're gonna see like uh, in the algorithmic framework that we're gonna develop. Uh, so we're not gonna consider the, the cardinality constraint in the second stage. And the result that we will show would not basically uh, extend to that uh, case where we have cardinality in the second stage. Uh, so uh, yeah, and we have like some other results uh, that are separate from the one that I'm showing you when we have like the, the nature of the problems would be different, yes. 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 So heuristically, uh, this probability of type J purchasing products, yeah. this formula, is it confirmed by, by uh, statistical studies of what people do in practice? I mean, yeah, so this is MNL model. It goes back to um, work of McFadden in the 80s. And this is one of the classical uh, choice models. Of course, I mean, there are data sets where uh, or like studies that shows like, uh, uh, you know, you want to use more sophisticated choice models. Um, but like one thing that's one result that is known in this uh, literature is that you can approximate any choice model within one minus epsilon by a mixture of multinomial logic models. And that's one thing. And the other thing is this is simple to, to uh, basically estimate because you want to estimate these VIJs from, from the data. So this is simple to estimate. It's widely used in, uh, in practice, yeah. Yes? So I guess in the same you can only have one customer of that type. Per, Sorry? Per iteration of this, you want to have one customer for that type? So basically, what we are doing here, we are maximizing the expected revenue from a customer visit. So when we have, so the customer will arrive with some probability uh, theta j. Yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah, sure, yes, yes. There is no dynamic setting here, yeah, sure. If you have 100 customers, you just multiply that by 100. Exactly. If you have a hundred customers, I think we're just not taking into, so here we are not talking about the dynamics, like you have one customer that's gonna buy a product and then you run out of these products, but uh, we are maximizing the expected revenue. So we can think about, we have a population of thousand customers and the expected revenue you're gonna get from one customer type is just theta j times the, the max, we are maximizing the expected revenue. Yeah. Okay. I should move some, but I will take one more question. So I'm assuming this model will be more useful for online purchasing, right? This, this is, yeah, this is, uh, I think, very useful for online retailers because you should be able to customize yeah. and drop some product, which is not, I would say, the case in brick and mortar. Like, you're not going to hide no, you your can't. product in the. Then the your model, store. your multinomial model might not be working for the online purchase. Sorry? Like, your, your model, yes. your multinomial model might not be effective for online purchase. So I'm saying this is an old model for in-store purchase. Yeah. But in online, it might not be working anymore. Uh, I mean, you can still use it. I mean, well, first, this is not my model here. That's uh, MNO, that's why they use it. Yeah, so yeah, I mean, this is something that is uh, very classical, like basically using okay. choice model to estimate the preference and to estimate this purchase probability, yeah. Okay, so. Okay, so this problem is closely related to another problem uh, that is well studied in the literature. So uh, our problem is if we forget about the max in the second stage, okay? And uh, that's the problem that you're gonna call without customization in this. So which means that whatever we carry in the first stage, we do not do this uh, further step of customizing the subset that I'm gonna show to customer type J. That, that's the problem that I call without customization. That's 
that is well studied in the lecture. This is exactly the assortment optimization problem and the mixture of multinomial logic model. That is just a single stage uh, problem. You need to select a subset S uh, of cardinality at most K, and then you show that subset to all customer types. You don't identify the customer type and then further uh, and drop some, some, some uh, products. That's the mixture of multinomial logic model. Um, let's know that this problem is hard to approximate within a factor better than one over M, where M is the number of customer type. That goes back to the work of uh, Antoine Desir, Vinit, and Javed Dang. Uh, this is as hard as the independent uh, uh, set, and there is no uh, better approximation than one over M. Okay, so the two questions that I would like to ask in this talk. So first question is, what is the value of customization? Okay. So how much extra revenue are we going to make if we basically drop some products in the second stage or and customize, not showing everything to everybody, OK? So we identify the type of the customers. And so basically comparing the objective value of these two optimization problems, uh, both theoretically. And we're going to see that uh, we're going to, as well, uh, try to answer this question empirically using some real data. And then. We will, for, from the, the technical results, we're gonna focus on how to solve CAP, how to solve this uh, two-stage problem, this maximization uh, problem. And in particular, can we develop an approximation algorithm that fits the one over M, this lower bound for the mixture of M and M. Okay, so this is the agenda for today. So to answer the first question, what we show, we show that customization can improve expected revenue by at most a factor of M. And uh, more importantly, this upper bound is tight. So in the paper, we construct a family of instances where the gap between uh, the, the, the problem without customization, this, this ZNT, uh, and the problem with customization scales linearly with, uh, with M, okay? And this, uh, this is an upper bound, okay? So that's the first thing here. So it can significantly improve the the revenue of a company by, by uh, customizing the, the, the products that are shown in the second stage. Now in terms of the complexity results. Um, so first we study the hardness or hardness of approximation of this uh, joint assortment and customization problem. Uh, we show that it is empty hard to approximate uh, the problem with a factor greater than one minus one over E. And uh, this is user reduction from max uh, K coverage problem. And in fact, this, this hardness uh, in approximately holds even in the case where all the theta J's are equal, all the, I mean, uh, the arrival probabilities are the same and all revenues are equal. So even in this simple settings where all the products have the same revenue and all customer types have the same arrival probability, then the problem is still hard to approximate within a factor better than one minus one over eight. And then, in fact, and this necessitates like a large number of customers. And in fact, even if we constrain the number of customers to be just a constant, let's say just two customer types, the problem is still uh, this is a weaker result, but it's still NP hard to approximate even for a constant number of uh, customers. So, natural question is like how to develop an approximation algorithm and how to solve in polynomial time this uh, this uh, this cap. Uh, so we'll design, we'll design a new algorithm that we will call augmented greedy that gives a, a log. So actually, because we have a maximization problem, that's one over log, one over log approximation uh, to cap. And in the case where M is constant, we develop a FETA, so fully polynomial time algorithm scheme for constant uh, M, okay? And this augmented greedy is, I would say, more general, uh, Algorithm that is not specific actually only to this to this uh, class of problems. So it has some interesting insights and uh, relates to some uh, nice uh, problems in the modular optimization. So the rest of this uh, uh, so talk, I'm going to focus more about the approximation algorithm before getting into the computational uh, study. Any questions? Okay. So let's look to the the problem. Okay, so this is our uh, problem. It's a two state maximization uh, problem. Let me call this function here the max over all subsets SJ in S. Let me call it FJ of S. Okay, so uh, this is basically the expected revenue from a customer 
from customer type J if we select uh, assortment S initial. Okay. So then the cap boils down to maximizing this set function. Sum of theta J F J is our set function subject to a cardinality constraint. Okay. So let's study the property of this uh, of this function here. So first thing, Fj is monotone. Okay. If we select more products in the first stage, uh, then we get higher expected revenue. That's not the case, for instance, for Rj. Right. Showing more product does not mean you get more revenue. Right. Uh, but selecting in the first stage more products. Uh, that implies that because you are self maximizing over all subsets, that means that your function is uh, monotone. Now, the second thing is that if the revenues of all products are equal, we show that the function is uh, submodular. Okay, so submodular means that this incremental difference when adding a new product to a set uh, decreases as the size of the set increases. Okay. What's the revenue of the product? I mean, we are like you think about it as the price. If you are maximizing uh, the revenue, as a, do you mean exactly price? Here? Because I would yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, the revenue of a product just means the the price or like price minus cost if you want to uh, maximize the profit instead of the revenue. Yeah, good. Question. Okay, so um, so yeah, so in the case when the product have the same revenues, then uh, we maximize a monotone submodular function. This is uh, can be done because we can get a one minus one over e approximation. This goes to the seminal work of very classical results of Nemhauser, Wolfson, and Fisher. You get one minus one over e approximation to cap, and uh, actually this is the best approximation you can get for maximizing uh, submodular uh, monotone uh, function. And you can do that using just the greedy algorithm, which will add iteratively the product that has the highest uh, that's uh, increasing the objective uh, function. Yeah. So this is this problem is what makes in some way this this problem easier than the other one without customization right? because there instead of FJ you have RJ, which is not necessarily yes monotone. yes yes which is not necessarily monotone yes that is true. Uh, but this is still, you know, uh, under revenue of all products are equal. Okay. And in fact, the other problem is the revenues are all equal is also easy to solve and we can solve okay. it in polynomial time. So like the question that was not clear at the beginning is whether this problem is easier or harder than the other one. Uh, yeah, we're going to show that it's easier than the first one because I've already said that you get one over log while the other one, you cannot get more than one over. Yeah, but this is still under the revenue. Uh, and this is a good question because this is, this is the best approximation. So remember, I, I, I said that the problem is hard to approximate within one minus one over e, even in the case where all revenues are equal. So, and in the other case, we can solve the MMNL, we can solve it in polynomial time when all the revenues are equal. So this is the best approximation we can get here. This is just using this classical result of some modularity and monotonicity. Uh, yeah. Yes. Um, can you go back one slide to the definition of RJ? Uh, RJ is just the revenue function. Yes. So, so when you defined it, yes. if all revenues are equal, it reduces down to the probability, right? It reduces down. I mean, not necessarily to, to, well, to the sum of the probabilities, which is right. one minus the number. Of so, yeah. so then, what's preventing me from just choosing one, which is the smallest uh, bij, to um, minimize the denominator? Like. You want to choose basically not the smallest. You want to choose the highest bij. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Gotcha. So when all the products are the same, what's gonna happen? When all the revenues are the same, what's gonna happen in this? You will take all the products in S. Okay. Okay. Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. Anyway, so there's not an interesting case. So in fact, in general, when general revenues, the the, the function is not some other, and that's the interesting case when we want to develop approximation algorithms. So we need a more general. Like, Algorithm than the than greedy. So let's so we design a new algorithm that we call it augmented greedy. So let me first introduce the algorithm and then uh, talk more about it and show how this will lead to a log approximation. So let's sort the products by revenues. R1 is the most expensive product, and Rn is the cheapest product. So we have this example from one to two. What I'm gonna do, so let's define a threshold R 
okay, that's going to split the product into two subsets, expensive product, let's say from one to seven that have revenue greater than R and then cheapest product A to Z. So I'm going to the, the, call these sets omega R. This is the set of products that have revenue uh, greater than R. Okay, and here I'm just reminding you of the definition of my function Fj. This is the function that we want to, we want to maximize some of theta j Fj. So Fj is just, you know, you are maximizing over all subsets of S, the revenue uh, are j of S. Okay. So this function, we said that this is not submodular. So it's not submodular over the universe of products. It's also not submodular over products which, are, which has revenue greater than R. Obviously, but the key lemma uh, that we show that the mean of Fj of S and R is some model in S over products in omega R. So if we consider this product that have revenue greater than R, Fj is not some modeler, but when we take the mean of Fj and R, we show that this uh, function is some model. Uh, so this is a, a key uh, lemma uh, in our proofs. Um, I'm gonna show it here. Um, believe me. Uh, yeah. And uh, so, based on this, the augmented greedy is the following. So, for each threshold R, we will use greedy to approximate the sum of theta j mean fj of R and R. So, this is basically gonna play a role of a proxy for the objective uh, function. Right, so instead of maximizing some of theta JFJ, we're going to threshold that with, with R, right? And then try to maximize this and find the, an assortment of size K. Well, this function here is you now submodular. It is also monotone. So greedy is going to give one minus one over E approximation to this, uh, to this function for each threshold R. Now, the end of the algorithm, we're just going to return the best assortment. So here, like we're gonna try all the thresholds. So you have n candidates. Uh, we return the best assortment, of course, based on the objective value of the problem that we are maximizing. So this is the algorithm, right? Any questions? Yes. Definition of fj in the last s you have the subscript j, right? Uh, j of s oh yeah, yeah. Sorry, j sorry. J sorry. Yes, 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 yes. Sorry. Good catch. This is a typo. Yes, j should be here. Ah, uh, yeah, thanks. Okay, so let's see why this, uh, what this uh, algorithm buys us. Uh, so that's the only slide or maybe two slides that I have with the proof here. Uh, so let's say the optimal product that I will select in cap uh, is S sub. So these are like the, the product in dark blue. Okay, so I have K product, one to K, okay? Then in the second stage, Optimum, what we're going to do is going to customize the subsets of products that we will show to each customer type. Those I will denote them by the green boxes. Okay, so SJ star is the optimal customized subset that I will show to customer type J. Uh, so for instance, for type one, well, I will drop products from two to K and show them only products one. Type two, I will show one to three, and so on and so forth. Okay, so these are the customized. Uh, subset. Uh, now I will use two properties of MNL in my uh, proof. Uh, so the first one is that SJ star is nested by revenue. So this is a classical property of assortment optimization under MNL that uh, you know you cannot skip. You will sort the product and you cannot skip one product. So for instance. Type two is going for one, two, three. So you cannot skip. Uh, so it's nested. You have only n candidate uh, possible uh, assortment. So either you go from one to k, or one to k minus one, or okay. So that is that's why basically uh, you will get this uh, triangle or this lower triangle or uh, matrix. And here I'm sorting types based on where do you stop. Type one is the one that uses the uh, or that is that uses the small number of products. So it's optimal to offer only products one. Any questions about this? Okay, they're still sorted by profit, by revenue. I'm um, sorry, I was not able Are to. Are they still sorted by revenue? Yes, yes, they're still sorted by revenue. Yes, so one is the most expensive product and K is the cheapest product, okay? 
yeah, so that's why we will get, yeah. So you go only to the uh, product one here and he one, two and so on and so forth. Uh, okay, so the second MNL property that I would like to use is, so a product is in the optimal assortment if and only if the revenue of that product is greater than the expected revenue we're gonna get from customer type J. Okay, so let's give an example. So you will keep adding products. So the revenue that you will get from that customer type is smaller than the revenue of the products. For instance, for type one, well, that we know that, that because it, it goes only for product one, that means that the revenue of product two is smaller than R1 of S one star. So for type two, the revenue of type two is between R3 and R4 because it stops at product three and so on for uh, type three. So that means the revenue is somewhere here between R4 and R5. Okay, good. So now I'm ready to show the log approximation. So remember like what augmented greedy was doing, considering a threshold R, right? And then uh, maximizing this function, this mean of FJ and R over the product that have revenues greater than R, okay? So, if we look to the optimal subset S star, the mean of FJ and FJ S star and R for type three and four is exactly the optimal revenue. Because this type three and four, well, the mean, we know that their optimal revenue is somewhere between R4 and R5, right? So it's smaller than, uh, than R. So it means the mean of FJ and R is exactly FJ of S star, okay? For product one and two, well, uh, the mean is R because their optimal revenue is somewhere here. So the mean is exactly uh, R. And for the other types, well, the, the expected value of this product is not the optimal because we are missing this product, okay? So this function that we are optimizing, which we use as a proxy for the objective function, will guarantee the, to get a constant approximation for the expected revenue from the customers that are in the red box. So augmented greedy gives a constant approximation to the optimal revenue of customers that are in the red box. So for its threshold, let's say my threshold was here, I will just look to the customer types that uh, you know, have this green box up to the threshold, augmented greedy would give us like a constant approximation for their expected revenue, yes. So for type three, you said that the expected revenue from type three would be more than R. No, smaller than between uh, between R4 and R5. So it's gonna be smaller than R4. So this R, think about it as R4. So let's go to this picture. So why can that be less than R5? Because there's this constant one in the denominator that he might they might not buy anything. So this is the optimal solution, mm -hmm. right? If the so basically this is a property of MNL. If basically R five is smaller than expected, is greater than expected, you would add it to the to the to the assortment of type three. So you will keep adding till your expected revenue becomes smaller than than the revenue of the product. Okay. So this is R four. This is R five. What we know is that the revenue of this customer is smaller than R four because it's included in the revenue and greater than R5 because R5 is not included in the revenue. So the mean of that and, and this revenue is exactly equal to FJ, uh, which is as well the case for these guys. So this guys is the mean is R. This guy is the, the optimal revenue. So it's exactly equal to the green boxes, but we are missing these other green boxes because we are optimizing our function only over the product that has a revenue greater than R. Yeah, so the bottom line here is like we get a constant approximation for the optimal revenue of the customers in the red box. Uh, any questions here? Okay, so yeah, so now to get the log approximation, what are we gonna do? So one way to think about it, let's just normalize uh, the, all the revenues of products uh, so that they are smaller than one and round them to revenues of two powers of half we lose at most a factor two here, okay? Because the objective function is linear in the revenues. The other thing we can do, we can disregard 
the product that has revenue smaller than one over M, uh, then I contribute it significantly to the optimal uh, revenue. And then we group customers into log M groups. So between one and one over M, since these are all powers of half, you have just log M groups. So you have log M groups here uh, that gives you at least half of up. And uh, their summation is actually equal to, to up. So which means one of them would give at least one over log. Um, and that's and we know that we can get a, a constant approximation for each one of the red box. So one of the red boxes would give us like one over log. Uh, that is the end for the log M proof uh, in the case of uniform theta j's. Any questions here? Uh, yes. I was wondering why you could just share the product of revenues less than one over M because what if all the products have revenues less than one over M? Yeah, so I've said normalize the product such that basically the highest product is one, just, just divide by R max, okay. right? Yeah. And uh, given that your highest, your most expensive product is one, disregard the ones that, in general, I would say disregard the product that has revenue greater, or smaller than R max over M. Uh, Omar? Oh. Yes. Yes, I'm here. Yeah, so I, I guess same question, but what if like all the value, like you also had this VIJ, what if all the value that everyone had was only on a product less than one over N? Wouldn't the revenue, wouldn't all the revenue still come from that small item? Like all the profit and like, you know, the purchase profit. Yeah, so basically, yeah. So like the, the way how, where you stop, like where the, like where you stop the green box, that depends on the VIJs, right? So suppose like the cheapest product has a very high, uh, revenue, then you will go up to the cheapest product uh, in your uh, in your assortment. Now, if you basically that product is uh, you know has some very high VIJs, right? Uh, but it has a revenue smaller than one over M. We are going to still disregard that because we know that there is this another customer type, which uh, going to give us like a, a revenue that is greater than M times that. So. Okay. Disregarding by a product less than one over M, we're not losing more than a half in the objective function. Hope that answers the question. Yep, thanks. Sorry. Yes. Okay, the green boxes that are above the red rectangle. Yes. Uh, for those, um, FJ of the optimal SJ, given your choice of S. Yes. Uh, is above R. Is uh, under R and greater than R plus one, the next product. So basically, I think maybe I confuse you with uh, my threshold of uh, R. So let me just go into this picture. So this line is exactly corresponding to you use R3. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So they are this, so they have revenue that is smaller than R3, right? But it's greater than R4. So the mean of FJ and R3 would be exactly FJ of these products, which is within a constant from FJ of SR, which we are not missing other products. So that's exactly the optimal revenue we're getting from. So my, my question yes. about this picture is for type one. Yes. It seems like when you run the augmented greedy algorithm, yes. you might choose to include type, you might choose to include product two in what you offer for type one because uh, the minimum of, of FJ. So what I will, no, I won't include no. type two because I'm gonna run my augmented greedy only in the first iteration, only for uh, basically product that has revenue greater than, uh, than R1. So two is not there. And uh, we know that basically this is a sub modular function here. You're gonna get one minus one over E, the optimal revenue of type one. Right, so we are getting the revenue of the red box here. I'm not including uh, two in the first iteration. I thought you were running. And then I will run, of course, augmented BD when like. And then you select the 
you select the S from the iteration that yes. gave you the best performance. Yes. And yes. then my, my question is then if when I take that S yes. and I look at so even though you consider yes, yes. like in an earlier iteration yes. a larger R. Yes. So when I take that S from that iteration. Exactly. You are saying your solution might for type one include the product too. Yeah. Yeah, yeah of course. And yeah. So you could throw that yes, yes, of like course. there's an improvement that doesn't yes, yes, your yes, bound. Yes, 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 okay. of course. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. So we, yeah, yeah. So we care so about. You can do all that. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. So you care about the expected revenue. That's going to be a constant approximation. But yeah, we are not mimicking what the optimal solution is doing. Yes. Okay. So let's uh, basically go. So this was just for unicorn arrival probability in the paper we show uh, log m in the general case uh, as well, where theta j is uh, uh, could be arbitrarily. And I won't have time to talk more about the FP pass that we, we for a constant M, we get a we get a fully uh, polynomial time approximation uh, scheme. Uh, so one plus epsilon approximation for the the problem. So here I want to spend some time talking about some uh, some numerics. Um, so before getting into that, well, we we ask the question: Can we design an IP for the for the for this uh, for this problem? Okay. So and in general, it's not clear whether we can design an IP for uh, for these two stage maximization problems. Um, and the answer here, like we were able to design an IP for uh, that gives one minus epsilon approximation for any uh, for any epsilon. So this is the problem. I'm just translating that to binary variables x i whether I'm going to include product i or not. Y j is the vector that gives me basically the product that I'm going to include for customer type J. And since this is a subset of X, so that's why J should be greater than X. So it's smaller than X. So I can translate that to the objective function. Uh, and if I call this again FJ of X, this is the same thing that I've defined before. Uh, so looking to FJ of X being greater than delta, uh, so I can linearize this, uh, this inequality. Um, so in particular, um, so that inequality means if the max is greater than delta, that means there exists a yj such that this ratio is greater than delta. Okay, so that would help me to take the denominator to the other side, uh, right? I, this is still not linear because I have a, this binary term yij times xi. Uh, but this problem is easier to solve because you know you will just basically take y i j to be equal to one when the revenue uh, I, uh, I is greater than delta. So the solution for this one is just ri minus delta positive parts v i j x i greater than delta. And this is linear, okay? So we can linearize this part f j of x being greater than delta. Now to get the one minus delta approximation, well, uh, we need to find a good lower bound for f j of x, something that is within one minus epsilon. So we can discretize the, basically the space of uh, revenue. So this is just a geometric grid where uh, the gap between two consecutive numbers is uh, one plus epsilon. And we will basically aim to get this uh, lower bound uh, delta k for one of the points in the grid. So this is xi is one product. So xi is just basically whether we offer the products or not. And ZJK is a binary variable that tells me whether uh, delta K is the lower bound that I'm aiming for. Uh, so I need to select K product. Uh, I need to select one lower bound. And uh, so this is the inequality that we show captures this uh, lower bound. So this is uh, an integer program that gives one minus epsilon uh, approximation to cap. And uh, we compared augmented greedy to this algorithm, sorry, to this IP, uh, of course, for small instances, because the IP becomes challenging for very large instances. What you observe is like basically out of 100 instances, most of uh, the instances augmented greedy is optimal, okay? Which was actually not the case for greedy algorithm. The algorithms that just pick iteratively the, Product that contributes the most to the objective value. So here also, so here the, the count out of 100, so this is zero. So no, all the instances were optimal one. So uh, the highest number that we've seen is just uh, four. Okay. Uh, 
Now let's talk a little bit about some uh, experiments with uh, with real data. So we are using a data set from Expedia. But let me describe first the data set. Um, by the way, can I go a little over? I mean, I don't know because I started. So what I time should I stop? Let's leave it to be like five minutes over. So like, okay, so I have nine minutes. minutes. Yeah. Okay, sure. Uh, okay, so this is the data set that we are using. Let me describe the data set. This is a data set called Hotel Bookies. Uh, it contains like hundreds of thousands of queries. Each query corresponds to a customer who wants to make a reservation on the Expedia website. Okay, so he will click on a couple of hotels. For instance, this is customer one. Okay, so we clicked on six hotels. Okay, and then uh, so we know through the last column whether the customer books the hotel or not. Okay. So, and as well, that includes the no purchase option. For instance, customer two clicks on these three hotels and didn't buy any. And then the rest of the columns, we have columns that will give us hotel features, okay, such that uh, start rating, the review score, whether it's part of a chain or not, the location score, of course, the price, which is, I think, the most important feature here, and some other features. And then we have uh, features that correspond to the customer type. And this includes whether the customer is making an early booking or not. So basically the number of days between uh, the booking and the, the time where he's trying to make the reservation, whether the reservation includes adults, kids, whether it's for a weekend stay or not. So these are like basically, uh, so the same in each query, but this corresponds to the same uh, customer. So the question that we want to ask, what is the value of customization here? So what if Expedia uses this information about the customer types uh, versus the case where they're gonna show the same assortment of hotels to all customers independently of these uh, four features. So this is the experimental setup. We define 16 customer types based on these features. So whether the customer is making an early booking versus late, whether uh, it's just for a single adult or multiple ones, whether uh, it has, there are some kids there or not, and then whether the booking is for a Saturday or not. So let's denote FI is the vector of features of the hotel. And uh, this is the sensitivity of customer type J to these features. So in particular, uh, so we're gonna uh, fit the data to, for each customer type, we're gonna fit the data to an MNL model where uh, VIJ, so is the preference weight of customer type J uh, to product I. This is basically exponential of a linear function of the features and uh, each feature is multiplied by this coefficient beta J. So when we fit the data is we learn in the parameters beta J uh, for each customer type. Uh, so this is an example, for instance, so here we are looking to the customer type with late booking, single adult, no children, and uh, uh, he's not staying for a Saturday, so think about them as the business travelers, okay? And these are the cheap customers, early booking uh, for uh, with children and multiple adults. And you can see that these coefficient beta j are different from a customer type to another one, okay? So for instance, this, uh, 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 Early booking customers, they are more price sensitive than uh, the business travelers. We see that like through this, uh, this coefficient here, um, as well as, uh, so we see that star rating and review score are positively correlated uh, to this utility while price is negatively correlated. Uh, and this is, and also this value, this is the highest uh, numbers, which means that the most important feature is the, is the price, okay? So once we learn this MNL for each uh, customer type, so this is the experiment. We're gonna take each query, right? We're gonna solve an assortment optimization problem that is customized. So which means we're gonna use the, identify the type of the customer and solve uh, an assortment optimization problem. So finding the optimal uh, subset of products or hotels to show to the customer given that we know the, the type of the customer, let's denote it S hat T. And then we're gonna compare that to an assortment optimization, which results from 
the, this mixture of MNLs. So assuming that we don't know the customer type, we're going to show the same assortment to all the customers. And this assortment would come from this optimization problem. So which is basically uh, uh, finding the best assortment for this mixture of, uh, of customers. And let's call it SC of NC. The value of customization is just how much we gain by customizing, which is basically the revenue of SC hat minus the revenue of this non-customized subset with respect to the non-customized subset. Uh, so yeah, so and here we see that basically uh, there is a value in customization, and uh, so what I report in here is the mean, the ninety-five percentile, and the max of this value of customization. Uh, so we increase the revenue by uh, around five percent, so depending on the customer side, uh, and these values go go up to in some instances to twenty percent or forty percent, uh, and this. These values are like more critical for like the customer types with small market share, because in any ways like this customer types with the, the highest theta j, well they will drive the, the mixture solution, uh, while this uh, customer type with the uh, small theta j, well if we treat them separately, that means we can um, get more revenue. So the Takeaway here is like we demonstrate the value of customization theoretically and empirically. We study the complexity of the joint custom assortment of customization. Uh, we design a new algorithm, augmented greedy, that gives a, a log approximation. Uh, we show as well uh, that this holds as well for capacity constraints. Uh, there is then the follow up work. So, this is similar type of the follow up work that tightens this bound. So, uh, and uh, so Ryan was able to show a constant approximation, which is still not tied to the one minus one over E, but improves significantly over the, the lot. And uh, we give an FP task for a constant uh, uh, customer type. Uh, so this is the, the reference of this paper. I'm not sure if I have time to talk about, uh, okay, so uh, that's fine. <laughs> This is my research agenda <laughs> in pictures. So I would just say a question about the topic. Question for clearly given it's over time, people have to leave this. Questions? Yes. So we live in the world where there is so much data that it's very easy to come up with a very large number of customer types, capital M, right? And based on your your approximation bounds, you probably would want to select the smaller number of customer types you really use in your optimization, little m. Uh, so can you explain more? What's like the question? My question is whether or not there is some way for you to narrow down the number of customer types which are worth pursuing. I see. Uh... I see. Yeah. So basically, yeah, that could be, yeah. So if M is very large and you're saying we solve the, the problem and the uh, cell basically did not get close to the optimal, then we can narrow down the. You could probably get closer to the optimal with a smaller number of customers. Yeah, that's, yeah right? yes, of course. Yes. But then the question is which customer subtype should they select? Yes, that's, yeah. So that's a question that we're not uh, considering. Hearing so like that's basically how to segment the how to segment the the, the market. Uh, but the good thing, I mean, the algorithm is log m here, and uh, there is a follow-up where we just give a constant. So even if this m gets uh, this gets higher, we are close to to the the, the optimum. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I mean, we're not studying how to segment the market to either small. I was just given a number for m from some. Work that I've done with Amazon in terms of how, like, what's like the order of magnitude of I mean the Amazon problem. But this, of course, this is a two stage problem that could be applied to many applications and could be different from an application to another. Yeah. Yes. So, in, in some sense, uh, the, so the log n down uh, is with respect okay. to the uh, customization problem. But mm -hmm. 
and sometimes the interesting question is how well does it compare to the uncustomized or the uncustomized version? Like how much of the customization benefit is the algorithm actually reaping? So yeah, I mean there are two questions. So one is comparing basically the uh, the objective values, and that's what the first theorem what I show. Like we could basically prove up to M. So the gap between the two, whether you customize versus you don't customize. And there are instances where this M is tight. And then how to solve the problems, where for the mixture of ML, that's the hardest problem in, and uh, doesn't have an approximation algorithm within a factor better than one over M. And all that we know is an IP, which is like in all the papers that I've seen, I mean, you can still solve it for 20 products, but it gets challenging for a large number of, uh, of products. It's an IP with a big M constraints. And, uh, so here we can basically develop, uh, we, we can improve it so we get a, we get a lot. And uh, the IP as well is faster than the one uh, for the mixture of M and Yeah. Yes. So um, customization could be viewed as uh, how many you're giving to each customer type, but I could also view it as placement. So uh, if I place it, you know, at the top, uh um maybe you know there's a higher probability that i choose that as opposed to placing a product at the bottom so have people thought about integrating this also where you kind of place the product as well yeah so that's the same question that peter was asking me before i started the talk uh yeah so here like in this literature so as we're not considering basically the order but i agree with you that order is very important in uh, uh in practice um Although I mean talking to some practitioners, like basically the order is driven by some factors that are out of their control sometimes, like sponsored product and uh, uh, but I agree that basically you know taking into account the, the the order would as well change the dynamics of the the problem instead of saying what is the optimal assortment that I want to show. You had the second question, what is the optimal assortment that I have shown in which order? Yeah. Yes. Is there a game here in the sense that, let's suppose instead of one platform, we look at it, two of them, right? Mm -hmm. So each one can offer the swim I and the customer, right? Yes. So you offer me something, you know, an XY offers me something else, right? Yes. And I would go, I would switch it between the two of you and choose yes. the one that I like yes. better. Yes. So, I mean, this is captured by this no purchase option. So basically the no purchase option is kind of like the market share for other competitors. Uh, yeah, so otherwise like it's not, yeah. Otherwise, like if there was no purchase option, I would always show the most expensive item and I'm sure that people will buy it. Uh, but then there is an incentive to increase the selection up to the point where, you know, my customer is still interested in buying something without, uh, uh, and I'm, I'm still making some, some uh, Revenue. Well, it's not exactly the same. That's because the customer being a strategic here, right? It's not sort of it's not exactly the same as simply no buy, right? I just simply choose, you know, from my point of view, what's the best option between the two of you. Yes, yes. Uh no, I agree with you. Yes. Yes. Um, to what extent are you um are you super comfortable that you can estimate these VIJs to good accuracy that's useful for the model? Yeah, so, okay, so the one of the reasons we are using this MNL model is that uh, the basically the estimation problem is tractable. Um, so the maximum likelihood estimation is a complex problem in the case of, uh, of MNL model. And uh, basically the, the, we are basically estimating this, this VIJs in the space of features, which is smaller than the space of products. So you kind of reduce like 10,000 products instead of looking to 10,000, you just look at the space of features and uh, uh, estimate this beta J. So I think this is widely used in, in, in practice, especially from the track level, but I agree there are other models, choice models, uh, where you would basically uh, do more sophisticated work to estimate this, this preference uh, uh, weight. Uh, but it's, it's again, so it becomes more challenging to estimate like they have this type of EM algorithm that would estimate this uh, this uh, VIJs. Uh, and then it depends as well on the data. The data should be very rich so that we can go to 
uh, estimate the marginal uh, product. But I mean, to answer your question, I mean, you're saying whether this is robust to the data, how to. A little bit, yeah. I mean, actually, I mean, I'm quite interested in the way that you answered that because uh, you could go with a more complex model, but you pay yeah. the price to have this to make many, many more things, and maybe you don't have a good estimate. Absolutely, yes, 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 yeah. So maybe just one more question since we've been waiting patiently yeah. at the back. Yes, yeah. <laughs> it's question. Um, so it's slightly speculative, but like one nice thing about MNL is that the assortment of people is revenue. Only. So yes. you sort everything, pick a cutoff point, and sort of pick yes. everything. There's sort of results which say revenue ordered is a good approximation for other settings. So is it enough? Like, suppose I just told you that this R function was on top, optimal assortment was revenue ordered. So it's sort of a discriminative model. Like, I don't need to estimate things. The discriminative model of what the optimal assortment looks like. Yeah. You think you can sort of port over that result into the setting, like say that we'll get an approximation as long as the optimal is revenue order. I mean, if you tell me that the solution would be revenue order, I mean, I have a polynomial time algorithm because then I would just enumerate it over. There are only n candidates that are revenue order. No, but selecting the initial k, like it's, it's revenue order condition number. Yeah, so yeah, yeah, I mean, that's what we, yes, exactly. I mean, the second stage is revenue order, and that's how I'm using that. Like when I mentioned this slide, that's, I mean, I call so them. Suppose I tell you that a revenue order assortment is yes. an alpha approximation. Yes. You immediately get a result which says you get an alpha log of approximation. Exactly, yes, true. Yes, that's absolutely, that's all I need. I mean, actually, sorry, I need two things. I need the revenue order, which I called in my slide nested, but I need as well that the revenue, the expected revenue from the customer. Uh, is greater than the product which you are not including. So that's another property of of, uh, of MNL. So basically, that picture that you know you will go and you will stop where the revenue becomes smaller than your expected. So if yeah, that, we need that two things in the technical uh, technical. So thing. Yeah. This holds for many more companies. So there's a result which yeah. says revenue order assortments are always a good approximation for regular. Functions. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, yes, there is this paper of uh, Hussein and Pat that uh, that is looking to revenue yeah, order. Paper of so yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. So one of the good thing about MNL that assortment optimization is revenue order, but as long as you add a constraint, uh, cardinality constraint, it's not revenue orders anymore. But there are some like uh, approximation or like sometimes we solve it with polynomial time even with cardinality constraint. So maybe we should end there and thank uh, Omar.